here's what I would like to, to just remind us. We're in the middle of our Jesus in the Old Testament series. Actually, we're towards the end of our Jesus in the Old Testament series. If you're watching online, I will put a link in the video description that has the entire playlist. It's like 19 videos so far. Um, but right now we're in Leviticus and Exodus, and we're in those passages that tend to be the tough more like what people consider boring passages of the Bible, um, which I'm fine with boring passages. I don't think the Bible was written for our entertainment. It was written for our help, for our edification, and to, to accomplish a lot of things. Sometimes those things God's accomplishing are not exciting at the moment. You know, nobody likes to watch the dominoes being set up when someone's got some 300,000 dominoes, giant goal they're coming towards, you know, but they all like watching them get knocked down. And what we have to do is we have to do a little bit of the setting up of the dominoes as we study the Old Testament so that we can then let Jesus knock them down for us, so to speak. We, we, we look at Christ and we say, how is Jesus pictured in this thing? So we're going to look at some of the dominoes and we're going to see how they fall into the shape of Christ in the book of Leviticus specifically. Okay, here's, here's the focus, Leviticus and Exodus. The high priest's garments and ordination. That is, what clothing, special clothing, did the high priest and only the high priest wear? And how did his ordination picture Christ? And I, I think this is exciting. I was actually going to move a lot faster in Leviticus and cover more. And as I was studying this, I thought, nah, I'm just going to do this one thing because it's cool. So, um, you're going to want to be with, in Leviticus 8. Um, also, we'll look at Exodus 28. Um, I can promise two things. I'm not going to do this exhaustively. There's going to be a few things that I'm not going to be covering. There's more typology in here than I'm probably going to get into. Um, and we'll probably be open for others discovering that stuff. But the other thing is this, is I do promise it will be neat. This is going to be it's, it's fun stuff. It's neat just seeing the pictures of what God has done um, in the text of Scripture. So Leviticus chapter 8, we, we did 1 through 7 last week. We, we talked about the five sacrifices. They're not the only five sacrifices in the Levitical law, but they're the five main sacrifices, the five repeated main normal sacrifices. We talked about how they picture Christ. Now we're in Leviticus chapter 8, where we have the ordination of the high priest and of his sons. Now there's two kinds of priesthoods in Israel, really. There's the Levitical priesthood, that is the whole tribe of Levi, they had a priesthood to themselves. But within the tribe of Levi, there was a family, the, the, the kids of Aaron and the descendants of Aaron, and they had the Aaronic priesthood. That's where the high priests were to, were to come from, was from Aaron's family. So it's, it's part of the Levitical priesthood, but it's like a subcategory of it. That high priest specially represents Jesus. That's what we get from the book of Hebrews. Um, Fifteen times the book of Hebrews calls Jesus our high priest. Fifteen times. Not just any priest, the high priest. And so we see he's not an Aaronic priest, that's not what I'm saying, but the Aaronic priesthood pictures Christ, right? He's Melchizedekian, that's a whole other study, which we already did, so check the playlist. And um, <laughs> neat stuff in there. Okay, so here we are, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil and the bowl of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread. So that's the items to be taken. And then assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. That's the tabernacle, right? And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. I kind of like that one of the names for the tabernacle is the tent of meeting, because again, the purpose of the tabernacle is God with man. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus is the tabernacle. That's a study we already did. Check the playlist. And, um, and then here we are. Notice the elements involved. For the ordination of the high priest, this is, this, is, this is the beginning of the beginnings, right? This is the first high priest, the first time he's ordained. Something special is happening here. It happens here in Leviticus 8. We need the garments. We need the anointing oil. We have to have the bowl of the sin offering. We have to have two rams. That'll be for the ordination offering, special kind of offering, not listed in the, in the five we mentioned before. And then there's the basket of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, of course, typifies Christ in its own ways. <clears throat> then verse three, we'll come back to those elements in a minute. Um, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. That's the first thing that happens in this ordination process. First, the whole congregation is there. Like, this is meant to be on display for everyone to see. There's nothing secret about it. And they're washed with water. That's step one. Where would they do the washing with water, perhaps? 
probably the oh, bronze right. laver, right? Yeah, right there, that bronze laver we talked about, which was made part, at least partly from the mirrors of the Egyptian women when they were plundered on their way out of Egypt. And um, they make the bronze laver. It's this picture of being washed, the washing of the water of the word. Um, <clears throat> it may be somehow a picture of uh, baptism as well in there. So that's the first thing that happens. Come, we'll come back to that. Just remember, the first thing they did before anything else was washing, right? Washing with water. Then in verse 7, <coughs> pardon me. And he put the coat on him and tied the sash around his waist and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastplate on him and in the breastplate, breast piece, he put the urim and the thummim and he set the turban on his head and on the turban in front, he set the golden plate, the holy crown as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, if you're like me, which some of you are going to be like me and this is, it's really hard to visualize that. And you could read it over and over and over again. And every time you're just like, wait, what, wait, what's an ephod? And there's a coat and turban and a sash. And there's, there's a plate, like a golden plate. Like I cannot put this picture together in my head. So what helps me and what I think will help you is I've made like a little presentation. I'll put up some images as we walk through the garments of the high priest. We'll talk about what they looked like, how they were worn, and then we'll also talk about some ways in which they pictured Christ. But you'll have a visual by the by the time we're done today. You will have a visual so that when you are reading this later in your life, you'll just have that visual pop up in your head and will hopefully click and you'll be able to make good sense of it. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's majority. That's what we get in Leviticus chapter seven or chapter eight about the garments of the high priest. Ezekiel 28 and Ezekiel 39, Ezekiel, sorry, Exodus. Exodus 28, 28, Exodus 39, give us a lot more details. So we're going to be borrowing information from those passages to fill in the gaps of our understanding on what's the ephod? What's the breastplate? What's this golden plate thing going on? Like, what is this stuff? What's the turban? Um, Urim and Thummim? I'm not going to help you on that one. Good luck. You're on your own. I'll give you a couple thoughts, but uh, but no, you won't be satisfied. Um, so, so go to Exodus 28, verse 2. And here we're learning uh, the first thing about these garments the high priest is wearing and that they're, they're putting on at the time of the ordination for Aaron. First thing we learn in Exodus 28 too is, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. The purpose of the garments were for what? Glory and beauty. It was meant to, like outwardly, he was supposed to look pretty amazing. That's the idea. Compared to everybody else that's there, he stands out as the glorious one, the beautiful one. Now, this is kind of different than the tabernacle, right? Because the tabernacle stands out, stands out as kind of this ugly looking, the outside skin on the tabernacle was not attractive. It was durable. It would withstand weather, but it wasn't nice to look at. Now, the inside of the tabernacle was beautiful and glorious. Well, the high priest is outwardly beautiful and glorious. And I think there's good reason for that. Um, John 1.14 talks about Jesus, how it says in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And that connects to the word tabernacle as well. Um, and we have seen his glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. I think already we have typology of Christ. The main idea behind these garments, don't get lost in the details. The main idea is glory. And Jesus, we saw him, the only begotten who is full of glory. The high priest represents Christ. Hebrews 15 times says the high priest, Jesus and the high priest are connected. He is our high priest. So... Glory and beauty. Notice this though. It's not Aaron in, in the clothes. It's not Aaron that's glorious and beautiful. It's the clothing that allows him to seem glorious and beautiful. And that's really important. We'll find out towards the end of the study. <coughs> As we continue, um, Exodus 28.3, it tells us how these things were made. It says, you shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. So the reproductions, like the images I'll show you, which I've gathered from online, basically, you know, these are just reproductions, okay? These aren't originals. I don't have originals, the original shorts of Aaron or anything like that. Um, but I'll put up these images, but I want you to know that they probably pale in comparison because God had filled them with skill so they could do this thing, so they can make these glorious and beautiful garments. So these are going to be like lesser representations. Consider them attempts. At, uh, at trying to reproduce. <clears throat> but I think that his original clothing would have probably been pretty impressive in many ways. It was skillfully, skillfully made. Reproductions often pale in comparison, and sometimes they look kind of silly. But the way that, you know, sometimes they're on weird looking mannequins and things like that, and so be it. I do appreciate people trying to help us out. 
Okay, now we're going to get into a bunch of stuff in Exodus 28, but the first thing I'll mention is that um, there's one thing that's not described in Leviticus that we do get in Exodus, and that is the shorts. There they are. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the undergarment piece that, uh, are you glad I didn't show them on a guy? This is, this is what no one would see, generally speaking, but he's wearing these shorts underneath. Exodus 28, 42 says, you shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs. And so it would have just been like long shorts, you know, like basketball shorts. That's the idea. So linen undergarments, the important thing here is they're white, they're made of linen, they're going to be pure is in conceptually, that's the idea of the white linen. Um, they're not mentioned in Levi, or in, in Levi, in Leviticus, which is pertains to the Levites. They're not mentioned in Leviticus. I think the reason is because um, this is about the public ordination, not the sewing and making of the garments. Right? The dis- description of the garments is in Exodus. Leviticus mentions the public ordination, and they're already wearing these when the process begins. So... They're not part of the process, part of the description. The next thing on the list is the coat, the white linen robe or coat. And here's an idea of a reproduction of it. This, is, this will go on, and you can see really, other than his head, his hands, and his feet, his whole body's covered by this white linen coat or robe. It just comes over the head, and then it has a white linen sash that also goes around it. Now this coat would actually have, and it's not really seen in this image, I couldn't find a good image for it to be honest, but it was made with a, with a checkered pattern, the scripture says. So it was, it was white linen, but it had like a checkered pattern. It had squares or diamonds on it in some sense. Uh, what would that look like? I don't know, I don't know, but you can imagine, but it was definitely all white. There was no colors involved whatsoever. The sash that you see tied around the waist there, that's to picture a white linen sash that was used as a belt. That's the main idea there. It just ties that coat around as a belt so he doesn't look like he's wearing a dress. That's the main goal here in my mind. I don't want him to look like he's wearing a dress, but that's just me. But, um, But when you see in context, we have the white undergarment. We have the white linen coat that covers his whole body. We have the white linen sash. What do you think this is symbolizing? Purity. Yeah, it's purity and holiness. That's the idea. He's being clothed in white, just like you needed to have for a lamb for a sacrifice. It had to be spotless and without blemish. Clean is the idea. So clean and unclean, strong, important symbols in the law. So we have this clean guy. He's the high priest. He's supposed to be like almost like he's sinless. That's the idea. Of course, the law will acknowledge he is sinful. It's his clothes that represent sinlessness. It's not him that's actually sinless, right? That would be Jesus. So he's representing Jesus, the one who, he's the shadow, Christ is the fulfillment in that. <clears throat> um, in Isaiah 118, we have a description of how this white purity type stuff comes in. It says, come now, God says, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And so the, the concept here is, a, it's a vision of purity. It's a vision of, of, of sinlessness. It was also beautifully embroidered. The scripture specifically says the sash itself was beautifully embroidered. So it would have had decorations on it and had really pretty stuff on it as well. Some people think that the, um, and even when I was much younger, I, I wondered this when I first started reading the Bible and I was like, okay, not make idols, not make graven images. Is it okay to even do artwork? I was very young, just starting to read the Bible on my own, you know? And, um, and when I came across the passages talking about the temple, the tabernacle, and I realized that God instructed them to do beautiful pieces of art inside the very place where God was worshipped, that the issue isn't making beautiful art. The issue is making it as an idol to bow down and worship. It's the worship of it. It's the idolatry of it. That's the problem. But beautiful art was actually part of the temple. It was even part of the priest's garments. So we'll get it more. There'll be more beautiful art as we move forward. <clears throat> the next thing was the turban. The turban something we don't generally think about nowadays, at least in America. We don't typically think about turbans. The idea with the turban is it's like a hat, or it may have been conically shaped. In Josephus, he's a first century historian. He mentions something that implies that the high priest had a, a like a cone shaped, how tall it was, I don't know, a turban. Um, that may be the case. It may not. Of course, Josephus, he's 1,400 years removed from the time. Of, and so who knows if that changed over time. We don't know exactly what it looked like, but it was also made of white linen. Now, that's all white clothing, um, and other, other than the actual turban itself, it's all underneath. Everything that we've described so far, the, the, the shorts, basically, right, the coat, 
or the uh, the robe that goes all the way down to the wrists. All this stuff will be covered by other things. Even the turban itself, as you can see, will have this gold plate on the top of it. I'll come back to that a little bit later and explain it. But it's all white. It's all white. So it's meant to symbolize that purity. Okay, the next thing on the list is the robe. And this we get in Exodus 28, uh, verse 31 through 34. It says, you shall make the robe of the ephod olive blue. I'll get back to the ephod later, so just pause on that. But the robe of the ephod is to be all blue. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding all around the opening, like a seam or, you know, some kind of decoration all around the opening, like the opening in a garment so that it may not tear. So it's just practical, pragmatic. On its hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns around its hem with bells of gold between them, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. So these alternating golden bells and pomegranates. So here's an idea of what the robe might have looked like. I'm not sure if it had sleeves or not. I've seen images, reproductions, where they have shorter, short sleeves on the robe or no sleeves on the robe. I don't know which one it had. If it's clear in the text, I haven't noticed that. Um, but it was just solid blue. So we have white underneath and we have a solid blue robe. On the hem of the robe, that's the interesting part of the robe, the bottom of the robe there, you have these pomegranates and golden bells. They're not real pomegranates. It's not like he was hanging actual fruit. It was meant to be something that looked like a pomegranate artistically. I, I would not be surprised if it was better than that, what you're seeing in the image here. Um, because I'm just thinking a skillful, you know, craftsman weaving and working with wool or whatever, they're, they're, Linda, they're going to be able to do this. These pomegranates and the bells, though, would make noise. And this is how you would hear the high priest walking around. Now, he was only wearing this outfit when he was inside the temple courtyard for his job as high priest, you know? It's kind of like when I worked at Taco Bell, I tried to not wear that outfit anywhere but Taco Bell <laughs> for reasons other than the high priest would have had. <laughs> but they were to only wear it inside the courtyard when they were ac actively working their duties as high priest. It's like this guy's more than just Aaron now. He's now the high priest, you know? He's now serving as our representative. He's doing something bigger. <clears throat> so it was solid blue, the robe. It was solid blue. It was... Um, it was on top of the coat, of the white coat. Like I said, likely didn't have sleeves. I'm not really sure, to be honest. And he would be heard. Now, some people think that the, the bells, as he's being heard walking through the courtyard, that the purpose of the bells, um, this is what they've said, is so God would hear him if he was coming near the tabernacle, so God wouldn't slay him. So God would be like, I hear you, so I won't kill you. Like it would alert God to his presence. Now, this immediately raises your suspicions because scripture is like very clear that God's aware of everything that happens everywhere at all times. So he's not like all, I'm going to, who's that? I'm going to kill him. Oh, dingle, dingle, ding. Oh no, it's all right. It's Aaron. It's okay. You know, um, that's really weird. So I will explain my, my, my theory as to why he had to wear these bells, quote, lest he die. I'll explain that towards the end. So you, just follow with me because there's, it's going to tie into some other things that I give you while we're on our way there. So he has that blue thing there. Um, and, and now I'm going to explain the colors in a minute. But just remember, we've got white underneath. We have the blue. And then on top of that, we have the ephod. Okay, the ephod, there's a few different recreations of the ephod. Um, the one you're looking at now has like this space. It's, it's that multicolored woven band. Ignore the breastplate. That's the square piece, the breast piece, the square piece that's in the middle of the picture here. The ephod would be the rest of what you're looking at that's multicolored. Now, others will have the ephod actually coming all the way up here like a tank top, you know, not without a space here. So I've seen both, and I don't know which one is, is right. Maybe nobody does. I don't know. <clears throat> but the ephod, the idea of the ephod is it's like a jerkin. And um, a, a jerkin, you're like, what's that? Well, if you ever, like, watch, like, some old shows where people are, like, sword fighting and they're wearing, like, that leather, that leather, like, little shirt skirt thing that you, they have a belt tied around that's a jerkin, right? It's a sleeveless thing that comes down. That's, so, it, your, maybe your translation would say jerkin, but then that wouldn't help you any more than ephod for most of us because we don't know what those are. Um, but yeah, that, that's the idea. So in the, with the ephod, think of, think of that like Shakespearean guy with these, you know, wherefore art thou Romeo and, you know, a pox on, plague on both your houses and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm replaying lines from uh, Romeo and Juliet for some reason. <clears throat> But back to the Bible. So, um, so that's the ephod. The ephod is, it, it's, you're like, what purpose, what function does an ephod serve? It's all about that, that breast piece that you see in the middle. The ephod is going to serve as a, 
um, a placement, a place to put the breast piece and a place to hang the breast piece. That's the idea. But let me describe the ephod for you a little bit. It's uh, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with gold threads mixed in, all woven together. So that's why you see multicolored there. Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. Those three colors, specifically, it's got to be those three. Anybody recognize those three colors from somewhere else in scripture? They're inside the tabernacle. These are the same colors as the tabernacle. The blue, the purple, and the scarlet. In fact, on the outside, the priest will look like what the tabernacle looks like on the inside. And I think that that's very significant. So when they see him, they're seeing, in a sense, a representative of the tabernacle. But he's also representative of them. You see, on the ephod, <clears throat> there's these two shoulder pieces above each shoulder, two pieces of two onyx stones, these, these black stones, and etched onto the stones are the names of the tribes of Israel. So here's, here's another image for you to look at, another reproduction. Um, and you can look at everything that we've talked about so far, except the breast piece, that center piece with all those little stones on it. I haven't talked about that yet. Here's a different reproduction that, that is slightly different. I want to show you the variety here because it's more about getting the main idea than all the little particulars. So here you can see in this picture, the turban is, is very different. The, the, the plate neck on the turban is, is different. The ephod is, is much bigger. Um, and the, the breast piece is higher up. And the, and the breast piece in the other reproduction was kind of towards the stomach, actually. So I would think this one is more accurate in my view, but I could be wrong. I'm just thinking breast pieces go over the breast. Um, <clears throat> the ephod itself, when you got in close to it, it would have had these... Um, these golden um, uh, rings. <laughs> I know there's a word for that. <laughs> these golden rings. And then golden chains, these fancy, really carefully jeweled, jewelerized, jewelified, jewelered. Is there a word for this? <laughs> jewelered? Is that a real word? Sometimes I make up words and later find out I didn't. It was a real word. And I'm like, yes. So it was, it was jewelerized. And, it, and they're... And they're hung. So here on the shoulder, you have the shoulder piece of the ephod, and it and it has these these ring and the chains, and that chain is going to be used to hang the breast piece onto the ephod. Um, <clears throat> the ephod also is tied around the waist, and then on the shoulder of the ephod is those onyx stones. The onyx stones had in, written, of course, in Hebrew, right? You have six of the tribes of Israel over each shoulder. And those stones just sit there, right? But the stones are, are designed, it's in gold setting and it has a little clasp on it. And the stone is designed to be where you hook the breast piece on so that the breast piece is hanging on the stones that are named after the tribes of Israel. One over each shoulder. <clears throat> Remember this, that the tribes of Israel are on his shoulders. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, the band of the ephod, which I showed you right here, it's tied like a belt. And um, it looked just like the ephod. So he looked like the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle, what was the purpose and function of the tabernacle? It housed the presence of God. The high priest looks like the tabernacle. I think that's significant. I think that's very significant. Again, John 114 says that God, or the word, who was, who was God and with God, right? He became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled amongst us. It was God's very presence living in and among us. What was sort of hidden in the tabernacle was like on display in the high priest. And when Jesus shows up to be our high priest, he's there saying, look, this is me. So Aaron's meant to look glorious and beautiful to represent the ultimate glory of God that had come to this earth. Now the breast piece. The breast piece is a very interesting thing. In fact, a lot of this kind of the culmination of a lot of what we've seen so far, it builds into this idea of this breast piece. It's not like a piece of armor is what we would tend to think of when we think breast piece because of all the RPG games you've all played growing up. Um, <laughs> but but there's, there's this idea of, no, it's just a, the piece that goes over his chest is the idea. It went on top of the ephod and it was meant to look like the ephod, same colors. Not, so by the way, I didn't mention this, but the red and the purple and the scarlet, those are colored linen, right? Colored linen, but the gold is actually gold thread, gold that's been turned into something you can weave into the actual ephod. So this is a very expensive piece of clothing. It's got gold woven into it. The bells around the, those are made out of gold. The breast, the, the, uh, the plate on the forehead, that's also going to be gold. 
So there's a lot of gold here. Um, now, this breast piece is really neat. Um, it was a base of woven blue, purple, and scarlet with gold, but it had what is obviously, you notice right there, it had these 12 polished stones, each set in gold, that were placed on the breast piece. Each of these had engraved on it the names of one of the tribes of Israel. So each one of them, 12 stones, 12 tribes, 12 names. The stones were specifically called out in the scripture. Which stone? This stone, this stone, this stone. And this, there's a whole other debate. What does that Hebrew word mean? Is it this stone or is it that stone? Like, which stone is that? You know, I don't know. I have no, I'm not even qualified to know which ones those are. But, um, but the main point is that he is bearing upon his chest the names of the tribes of Israel, hung upon, attached to the names of the tribes of Israel on his shoulders. Do you get the idea? The high priest represents Israel, the people. He's one man going before God, bearing the people as a representative of the people, one man to represent them all. That's the idea. That's really, really important to understand this with the high priest. Jesus, he's the one man who comes in our place to represent us all. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. How so? He represented me. But this isn't some new New Testament idea. This is scripture going back thousands of years. This is the high priest bearing the people of Israel before God, sort of wearing them on their behalf. He's propitiating for them, so to speak. Romans 6, 6, it says, we know that our old self was crucified with him. How? Represent representatively. Rep that's a word. I'm pretty sure that's a word. Just trust me. Don't look it up. Hebrews 9, 24, it says, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So as the high priest bears Israel, so Jesus bears all mankind. Like when he says, and John, I, I'll never, I always keep thinking of what John said when he saw Jesus. He says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, not Israel, the world. He bears us all to the presence of God. So the high priest is a shadow of that. What he does in shadow for Israel, Christ does in fullness for the world. Huge, huge. So these gold, gold set precious stones, that also speaks of value. What does God think of his people? He has each of them having their name engraved on a precious stone set in gold placed upon his chest. What does the Lord think of you? What is the value that he places on you as he goes into your, your to die in your place? It's not so much, here's how much I'm worth. It's more like, here's how much he paid for me. I mean, this is, this is what he spent to take care of me. We all, I think, get this when we go to the vet with our pet that we love, mm -hmm. as I did recently, and you spend way more money than you had planned <laughs> because you just love your pet so much. This is, uh, this is, yet this is a terrible example compared to the incredible love that God has for us. That he's, he just says, look, I just love you. I love you. I love you this much. I'll pay this much for you. You're, you're this precious thing to me. But I'm not worth it, Lord. And he goes, yeah, what love is what is, is, is the value I place on you is love. For love, I laid down my life for you. Powerful. So now we're going to read it. And I want you guys to, um, to visualize what you've got so far here. I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'll do more. I'll do the, the, the plate of gold and a couple of the urim and thummim in just a moment. But first, let me just read through Exodus 28, verses 6 through 9. And I want you to, as I'm reading it, try to visualize it. Because this is what's really hard to do when you haven't seen these things, right? So here we go. Exodus 28, 6 through 9. Try to get the image in your mind so that later on it just clicks when you hear descriptions in the scripture. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and purple and scarlet yarns and a fine twined linen skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven band on it shall be made, uh, shall be made like it and be of one piece with it of gold, blue, and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the, on the one stone. And on the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree. 
and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. You shall make settings of gold filigree and two chains of pure gold twisted like cords, and you shall attach the corded chains to the settings. So you get, you're getting sort of the visual now. It's, I mean, otherwise you don't see it. It's just, I have a really hard time putting it together. But now I picture, okay, the stones, and then there's the gold, and that's where I'm going to hang this, this breast piece. So the ephod, and, and um, it does say of one piece with the, the, the sash or the belt of it will be of one piece. So it probably would be attached there. I don't know if I had noticed that or forgot it. But um, <clears throat> Then we get to the Urim and Thummim. Urim and Thummim are interesting. Um, I don't have a picture of them. And the reason is because we don't know what they are. Urim and Thummim are two words. It, it, they mean, if you translate the words themselves, they mean lights and perfections or light and perfection. The M is a plural, but it's complicated in Hebrew. So... Have fun with that. But Urim and Thummim, um, what are they? Well, here's a couple options. Some people think they're like two stones of some kind and that they were kept inside the breast, the breast piece. The breast piece was made and then folded and then placed over. So it had cloth on both sides and could have been kind of like a pocket. So he could have had these things inside his breast piece. Or maybe, and I'm not saying this is the case, but maybe it's a synonym for all of the 12 stones. That the 12 stones for the tribes of Israel are called the Urim and Thummim. Um, there was six on each, six names on each stone here, and so maybe there's two names for them, Urim and Thummim. Um, either way, the Urim and Thummim were here somewhere. And they had something to do with how the priest would make decisions or would discern God's will, what God was saying to people. Which may be the reason why God has not allowed the details of them to be passed down. Because if God's not doing that, you know there'll just be a whole cult, the Urim and Thummimites, right? That'll, <clears throat> you know it, right? And so... If God doesn't want it to continue, he doesn't give all the details for them to reproduce it. That's the idea, I think. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not alone in that. There's actually some Jewish commentators that would say the same thing. Well, God doesn't tell us what it is because he took that away from us and we don't get to do it anymore. And he doesn't want us trying to make it happen. And so, yeah. <clears throat> so it's shrouded in mystery. That's true. I think it happens to be on, pur on purpose. But the two words themselves, light and perfection. I mean, this describes Jesus, does it not? He's the light of the world and he's the only one who walked in perfection. He was the perfect one. Um, so that may be the case. Finally, we get to, there we go, the, <clears throat> the golden plate. The golden plate, what was, it, what was it exactly? Well, the word plate that we have there in the text, it could actually refer to like a flower petal. So when it says make a plate of gold, it could, the word itself etymologically might refer to a flower petal there. So it may have been prettily designed or it might have just been a flat uh, plate. I don't know. Um, it could have been either way. But in Exodus 28, verse 36, we get a description of it. It says, And you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. That's what that Hebrew is there, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. <clears throat> it's a plate of gold, holy to the Lord is is inscribed on it, and the, the blue ribbon you see there on the sides, it would have held it in place. Some people think the ribbon would have had to come over the top or maybe at angles in order to keep it from falling down. I don't know. Go make a gold plate and try it out a few different ways. You can figure it out. Um, um, in Exodus 28, 38, we get more details. It says, It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things. That's interesting. Aaron's going to bear guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. You see, Aaron's supposed to have this job of bearing guilt, but he can't do it in and of himself. He's got to have these clothes on. He has to have holy to the Lord written on his head because he's not really holy. He's got to have this sort of um, imitation so he can be a imitation of the one who does bear our guilt, the one who is holy, the one who does stand in glory and come with all of his, his godliness and he dies on our behalf. It's interesting that he has to bear guilt. And this is called actually specifically as a holy crown, the text calls it, a holy crown, like it's a royalty thing. So the, the high priest has like this crown, this like royalty thing on his head and it's holy to the Lord and it's made of solid gold. That's interesting. Jesus, he has a couple crowns in the text of scriptures. 
we can read about a couple different ones. In John 19, it says the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came and said to him, uh, hail king of the Jews and struck him with their hands and they beat him. He wears this crown of thorns. Now, Aaron's wearing this glorious looking crown. Christ wears this crown of thorns. The purpose of Aaron's crown is that he might bear not only the iniquity of people, but rather the iniquity of even the things. Notice that the crown's related to the iniquity of the holy things. These things are going to go to God. Well, they have to be cleansed, so to speak. Something's wrong with them. They're going to be holy to God. Well, then where's their guilt going to go? Because the fall of man brought sin to the world, not just to man. Right? It stained and affected the world. So he has to bear the guilt of even the things presented to God to be holy. The world itself has to be somehow reconciled to God. So Jesus, he wears the crown of thorns when he's reconciling the world to God. Why thorns? In Genesis 3.17, it's part of the curse. It's part of the very reason or the very result of the fall. And to you, <clears throat> Adam, he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. The the world itself received a curse from the sin of Adam. He goes on, In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. The nature of the ground being cursed, the nature of the the pain on creation, the growing pains, the groaning pains, not growing, the groaning in pains. I'm speaking of Romans 8 here, if you know the passage. Uh, the nature of that is, is symbolized in thorns and thistles. Of all the bad things that happened as a result of the fall of man, it's symbolized in thorns and thistles. Jesus, bearing the iniquity of the holy things, the things that will be recreated, brought into God's glory, the heavens and earth remade, wherein righteousness dwells, right? To make this unto the Lord, he bears not only the sin of man, but he, wear, he bears the curse from Adam. I think he's paying for all of it. He's paying for all of it. That's why he's worthy to take up the scroll. Because the earth belongs to him. He bore the guilt of the holy things, which is going to be all things. So I'm just like, like I just I think this is amazing stuff. I think it's just, I'm excited about it. And previously, you know, not knowing the typology of it, you may read it and be like, I don't know what to do with this. Um, well, here we go. This is what you do with it. <clears throat> Then we have another crown that Christ wears in Revelation 14, 14. It says, Then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And so that he, he bore, he has both. He has this crown of thorns, this king who suffers, and he has the crown of glory, which he wears permanently. Um, now, what's interesting is this. When you look at, all, at this uh, symbolism, the... The, the garments of the high priest, he would make him stand out. He'd look like nobody else there, right? Glorious. On the outside, he looks like the tabernacle looks on the inside, just as Jesus comes in. He is tabernacling amongst us. Yet there's one day of the year when the high priest, in his normal duties, he would have to take off most of these clothes. He would actually take off. He would take off the breast piece. He would take off the ephod. He would take off the blue robe. And he would be clothed in only white. That day is the day of atonement. The day of atonement is the one day of the year where the high priest was actually going to go into the Holy of Holies. And notice he's not wearing the bells. So it's not like God's like, you better have the bells on that day or I won't know you're coming and I'll kill you. No, that's not, the, that's not, the, that's not what it means. Uh, he's not even wearing them that day. He doesn't even have that robe on that day when he goes into the actual Holy of Holies. On that one day he goes into the Holy of Holies, he only wears the white linen garments. So he, he comes not glorious. He comes like he's just a sinless guy. When Jesus came to this earth, he set aside his glory. And when he paid the price for our sins, he wasn't outwardly like the tabernacle. He just looked like a perfect guy. He just looked like a sinless representative going to God on our behalf. That's the Day of Atonement. That's a whole other study to look at the Day of Atonement. There's a ton of stuff in there. But this is neat to me, and it relates to the garments of the high priest. It's the one day of the year. He would take them all off except for the white garments. Then after he offered... And gave the offering. He was washed and he would put on pure garments again, clean garments again, and his normal, his normal garments. He would take up his glory. Remember it was for beauty and glory? Well, he laid aside the beauty and glory. He made the one offering a year. Then he would come out and he would take them up again. And so for one small little season, when the, one of the most important sacrifices is taking place of the yearly sacrifices, he's going to the Holy of Holies. 
they would see their high priest suddenly look like just a normal guy. Suddenly all the trappings and all, he just looked like a normal guy. And he comes and he pays the price, so to speak. And then he comes out and he takes up his glory. He looks glorious and beautiful again. And then they can celebrate because they know the job's been done. And so we have Christ who comes in human form. He dies for our sins. He rises again in glory and uh, takes, up, takes up his beauty and glory again. Now, let's talk for a second about lest you die. Okay, it comes up a couple times. Exodus 28, 35. It says, speaking of the, the blue robe, it says, And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out so that he does not die. Other times he would, go to the, he would go in before the holy place, but not into the holy place, right? When he goes into the holy place, he's just wearing white garments. But when he's going before the holy place, other times he has the, the robe on. And it says here, the sound will be heard that he should not die. Then Exodus 28, 43, we get that again, more detail. And they shall be on Aaron and his sons when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. So now we get the idea that the garments themselves will keep Aaron and his sons from personally bearing guilt because in a sense, the garments are bearing the guilt. That's why you won't die. The sound of this thing will be heard because as you wear this thing, you are representing something that can bear the guilt. You have something clothing you, but Aaron, between you and God right now, is something that will bear the guilt. And it's, this, it's these garments because they represent Christ. So if you come in and you think you're good enough, you're not. You're not good enough. See, because they did have to bear guilt. There's this interesting contrast. The statement is, lest they bear guilt and die. That's in verse uh, 43. But then in Leviticus 10, 17, it says this, that they have to actually bear guilt. Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary? Since it is a thing most holy and has been given to you that you may bear the iniquity same, same word as guilt, same Hebrew word as guilt in Exodus 28, 43. So bearing the guilt of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. So he has to bear their iniquity. But yet, if he's not wearing these clothes, he's got his own sin issues. He's bearing his own guilt issues and he'll be struck down. Exodus 28, verse 30, <clears throat> it says this, And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. So in a sense, you could say this. I think this is clear. The clothing bears the guilt. Aaron, if you don't have that clothes, you're going to bear it, and you will not make it, buddy, because you are not holy. My conclusion is this. The garments of the high priest are not saying whoever, you know, Aaron stands here as the high priest, he's good enough to come and stand before God. In fact, the garments of the high priest are there because Aaron's not good enough to stand before God. He wears these garments because he is not good enough. But they represent someone who is. They represent the one who is white and clean, who is sinless. They represent the one who looks like the tabernacle on the outside. He has God tabernacling in and with us and amongst us. And the one who bears us before God's presence to carry our guilt. He must be sinless and he must be here in a human body tabernacling. He has to be with us in physical form to bear our guilt, to be suffering for our sins. So Aaron, you're not good enough, but you can be a representative of the one who is. But don't mess up that, that, that representation or else it's on you, buddy. So in a sense, Aaron was able to do his functions as high priest because Jesus did his functions as high priest. Aaron was only able to even be the shadow because Jesus was casting it from the future. Back to the future. Something like that. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful, amazing stuff. I love it. I think by the grace of Christ, Aaron was able to minister as high priest and that's the main picture that's there. And I have some more details here, but I think I'll skip it for now. I will say this. Two things um, about the baptism. And as you look in Leviticus uh, 8, and you see their ordination. A couple things. Um, Aaron and his sons have a different process for their ordination. Aaron, he's, they're all washed, right? Then they put on the garments. Then um, Aaron is the one who gets oil poured over him, whereas his sons don't have oil poured over them. It's only poured over Aaron. Jesus also had oil poured over him on his head in particular in Mark. The Gospel of Mark, we read about it. So there's, a, there's something special there about having oil poured over you. That's something special. Like it says in, in Psalm 133, uh, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like oil poured out upon the head of Aaron running down his beard. 
because it was very special. It was on the head of Aaron, not just anybody, right? The anointing oil, the idea of this oil. Now they would put oil for other purposes, right? But the anointing oil, this, this only on the head of Aaron. Others didn't receive it on their head. They received it in other places. Also, Aaron, he receives this anointing before the blood is applied to him, which is really interesting. He gets it on his ear, on his thumb, and on his big toe. Remember, the rest of his body is pretty much covered by the clothing. His sons also get it on their ear, on their right thumb, and on their right big toe, representing kind of symbolically all of their life, all of their body. Aaron, he receives the anointing before the blood, whereas his sons, not the high priest, they receive the anointing after the blood. They have to get blood first. So Aaron, he comes, he's washed with water, he's anointed with oil, and then afterwards blood is applied. Whereas everybody else, you need the blood first, then you can have the oil. What oil represents? The Holy Spirit. Christ comes, he's washed, baptism, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And it's only after this, he dies and sacrifices himself for our sins. And then when his blood is applied, he breathes on his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And the oil is applied to them. And I'm just like, ooh. You know? <laughs> like, that's cool. I, and there's more scripture I could give you there, but I, as, as usual, I just have too many notes. Um, so yeah, that, that's all in Leviticus 8 about the, con- the order of the consecration and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, really neat stuff. Really neat stuff. Uh, the priest and the priesthood and the things we see there are shadows representing Jesus. It's not an afterthought. It's, it's a plan. It's an agenda. You wouldn't understand who Jesus is without Leviticus. You wouldn't know what he was doing without Exodus. You wouldn't know who the Lamb of God was who takes away the sin of the world without the Passover of the Lamb, without the, the high priest, without the, ta- with the tabernacle, all that stuff. And so um, what God has done is he's, he's told the most beautiful story in history in an incredibly elaborate and beautiful way using the lives of real people in history and the structure of the law and of the priesthood to demonstrate who Jesus is in a hundred different ways so that we could have the veil come off when one comes to Christ and the veil is removed and then we see where Jesus says, right? You believe Moses? Well, if you believe Moses, you believe me because he wrote of me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this amazing stuff. It's, it's kind of fun to get excited um, about the garments of the high priest of all things. Um, we see the tapestry of Christ in the text of scripture. We pray that we could see it more and more clearly all the time. We pray that you'd give us just a, um, a Christ centric way of understanding the old Testament to be able to pull out of it. That which you've always placed there, Lord, um, cause Moses wrote of him. We thank you, Jesus, for being our representative, the perfect man, sinless to stand and go on our behalf Um, to bear the iniquity of the world that you might bring us to God, that the way might be made. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you so much that we can now come boldly. In Jesus' name, amen.